and I'll share my screen with you guys. So um, this book club comes out of the book that uh, I wrote with a great deal of help from my wife, Sarah Sanders, um, that was released back in October of 2020, a wonderful pandemic release in order to kind of dive deeper into a lot of the stuff that um, didn't make it into the book. I started the book club as a means of expanding on a lot of the ideas and things that were within the book. And so for me, all of these conversations revolve around specific themes. And the theme for me today really is conviction. Um, we'll be talking with David Crude here in just a few moments, who has a very long publishing career and long dedicated uh, focus of publishing with William Kentridge, and that's the primary focus of what we'll be talking about today. But to really talk about this idea of conviction, uh, it, it comes in a, way, a lot of ways in print, and Goya always comes to mind with as an artist who believed so much in the work that he was doing that, as in the case of the disasters of war, he made an 80 suite. Uh, series of etchings that he knew would never be published while he was alive. And, and it was because it wasn't, um, he wasn't really allowed to do it. And I thought that this particular image from the Disasters of War series was um, unfortunately too relevant to today and with what's going on in Ukraine and other parts of the world. But for Goya, it was that dedication to not only just his ideas, but a commitment to the process of Intaglio. Um, for Degas, it was a commitment to the process of monotype. It was something that he loved to do. It wasn't financially lucrative for him at the time. And he was one of the greatest proselytizers of the medium, trying to get everyone and anyone he ever came across to work on a monotype. And so because of his absolute conviction and, of, and faith in what the process could offer him. George Rualt also comes to mind as another one of those people who his body of work, the miseries, the 52 plate uh, suite of prints that took 30 years to come to final publication and fruition. And it's that dedication to the ideas that you have and the voice that you have as an artist to be willing to take whatever time it takes. You know, and jumping to a contemporary example of this, Alan Gallagher's uh, project that was published with Two Palms Deluxe. It's a 60 printed object series of works that took more than two years to complete. And it's an over the top body of work when you, if you ever get a chance to see one of these in person, one of these sets of 60 images, the work that went into this, not just from a creative productive um, sense, but also an additioning sense, just took a great deal of faith and conviction on behalf of the artists, the printers, and the publisher um, involved in that project. Another artist that who comes out of the book is Kate Shepard, who has been working on a suite of theme and variations of the similar format, but with color changes since 2009. And they, you know, each body has a, a different kind of inspirational title. And her most recent variation of this was News, which there was a wonderful publication of that was done by Hiram Butler Gallery in Houston, if you ever get a chance for that. But her dedication to the process of printing, not just the idea of this project, but also with the printer. She's been doing this project with Luther Davis since 2009, and she's now in the third print shop with Luther. So she's just carried this project wherever he's been. And it's you know, that, that dedication that the two of them have and that conversation that they develop over time, you know, which leads us to David Krupp. And David, who I first met um, in 2008 at an IPCNY jurying, uh, show jurying process. And he, um, he and I sat then in that together. And what, um, what came out of that day, and I, David can uh, chime in, unmute and chime in on this too, what came out of that day for me and for David was a realization that one, we were both very interested and very vocal with prints. Um, and we had a kind of a similar approach and aesthetic. We both were saying thumbs up to almost every one of the same images and thumbs down to almost all of the same images. And so for us, it was a, uh, a wonderful process, but you know, David, really got here your start we were just talking talking about this David right in 1982 that was the first print you published is that right yeah Joe Tilson 19 1981 in fact very very soon after becoming involved in the arts I published my first edition with Jack Sheriff as a master printer and so for for you um I think something that people really ought to know a bit about as well is that as a publisher you've always been interested in providing your artists with the greatest level of opportunities to make and push their work, right? So I've never known you as a publisher to 
just want to make pictures, but it's more about making projects with purpose or images with purpose and putting people together to see what interesting things can happen. And, and I wonder if you could tell people a little bit about Jack Sheriff and why, why he was such a specific printer you wanted to send William to in his, his early days, because I'm not sure if everybody knows who he is. Okay, well, yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, just to go one step back, um, when I did become involved in the arts professionally, sort of 1980, 81, uh, I knew a fair amount, but I was very much a, a novice. And I was very, I was very flattered that actually artists were willing to talk to me because I really couldn't bring much to the party. And I, and the first print with, um, which I did with Jack Sheriff and Joe Torson, which was because of Alan Christia, and it was then Waddington Graphics, uh, was Joe Torson and Phil, and, and, and uh, Jack Sheriff was a printer. Mm -hmm. And I remember going on my first studio visit beforehand, and I ended up telling him about his tax, how to save on tax, because I really didn't have the knowledge to be understanding or talking about what the product was. I mean, I love the idea of publishing. Um, I love the idea of being able to share works um, which, which I had the total responsibility to share. The, my career really started in, in, uh, in the early 80s, uh, even earlier with, um, you know, with works, with dealing with uh, uh, David Hockney's work. David Hockney was, a great etcher, he had a great publisher, Paul, you know, Paul Cornwall Jones. And um, it was really exciting. And I did shows around the world because I, I lived in London and I moved around. So I did shows called Whatever Happened to Pop Art, which would include the works of Andy Warhol, Richard Hamilton, Jim Dye, and David Hockney. But it, it just felt it'd be something which I could, you know, have the total. You know, it would be sort of a part of, I owned it and I could promote the artist and I could spend all my time on it rather than worrying about a whole load of, of other prints. So uh, it, it, it was, it, it sort of, uh, I was, was so fortunate that I was able to work with Jack because Jack's background, what he was an artist and like many artists, he gave up the prospect because he knew he wouldn't be able to make a living as it. And so he ended up becoming a teacher. And uh, there was a, a, an art college started in Corsham uh, by, I think it was Lord Methuen who'd, who'd inherited the family fortune. And he was a single man and he had this huge estate in Wiltshire. And he invited, so he had various people teaching. So Howard Hodgkin taught there, Richard Hamilton and Jack. Uh, and uh, then what happened was that came, and then I think Joe Tolson was nearby. He also lived nearby. So that carried on for a few years, but then the family got Lord Methuen to close down Corsham Art College. I think it was slightly in disrepute as well. Um, and he, uh, Jack carried on in that area and he opened his own workshop. Uh, in a little place called Chapman's Laid. And he was doing these works with Joe Tilson and they were all incredibly complex. They were like 10 colors, 15 colors. What I loved about Joe Tilson, he broke all the rules. He, he put pins into the works. He ate his prints, he, he attached uh, templates onto it. And so my first experience was anything goes and Jack was just what, you know, he just was that sort of guy. And so I didn't have that sense. I had to be very precious about being a publisher and the editions. And um, the great other great thing about Jack was crazy. He wanted to do things bigger than anybody else. And I mean, besides everything else, you know, he, he sailed across the Atlantic on, the, on, a, on a yacht. He, as he grew older, he, he started flying stunt planes. So he had, he's a man who lived life the full, and I really enjoyed those interactions with him. So in the case of, say, so he was basically the man who held my hand. Uh, I also learned the, to understand the relationship that exists between the printer and the artist, and realized how important it was to be doing research before you invited 
an artist to go and work up with a printer. You, did, you didn't want to have a situation where they just didn't get on with each other. And also you, you didn't, you know, you, you, you hope that having observed what Paul Cornell Jones had done with David Hockney, he'd had already a 10 or 15 year uh, history with him. And so this was going to be a long journey. And having met William uh, just casually on what I thought was my last visit to Johannesburg, he, he happened to be coming over to the UK uh, to do a show with uh, Vanessa Deverooks, who actually, which is uh, Richard Branson's sister. And I said, look, you know, and this was happening the week after I met him, Joe, I said, well, why don't you just go down to this chap, Jack Sheriff Studio? Firstly, you can work in huge format. You can use color, which was something he, he wasn't ever doing or maybe not always wanting to do. And um, they got on very well because Jack, you know, anything went with Jack. And so William started doing large plates. And I think that's where he got very, very excited, this ability uh, to, to work very, very large because he had a standard format then he, in those stages, early stages, when he used to do his drawings, they were all one meter 20 by one meter 60. That was his standard. And even when he worked on his films, he used a sheet of paper, one meter 60 by 120 to make his mark, step back to his camera, come back, take two frames, get backwards and forwards. So he had just completed this group of, of films, these four films, uh, they, which were old fashioned sort of animation. And, um, he, uh, he, he was a really a dedicated printmaker, which I hadn't realized, but a lot of the work was very small. And so the idea of working very, very large was a very new experience for him. And uh, it was, it, and in fact, I, the reason I was also interested in meeting him was because he, he, I wanted to learn about film. To me, in the early 90s, everybody realized video was becoming, and, you know, very involved, it was developing digital. And you always wanted to be, you know, at the cutting edge, you might say. And where I used to be very lucky, I was pretty unattached in the sense I, I lived in London, but I was moving around all the time. And the only day I used to know where I was gonna be was Mother's Day, because that was the day the, of the Chicago Art Fair. And that for 20 years, I was there every year and met this whole network, including one Susie Locke, who's great, I see is on here, which is so lovely. And, um, that is also where I sort of you know developed that confidence to feel uh, to learn faster in terms of the arts. So that was it. So William then going and doing these editions. In fact, uh, there's a, a work behind my head, which was in fact almost the first plate he did. In fact, it was the first place, but he made he was so excited he made about eight or nine plates. It took about five years for them all to be editioned. And um, where I was also very fortunate because I was always moving around the States. Um, it was a, a wonderful time in history because the sort of wall had come down in South Africa, apartheid had come to an end. And there I was, this guy with a different accent wandering around America, befriending lots of art dealers who were very happy to have me stay with them. And uh, you know, I would be telling them how to become a publisher. And um, so anyway, that was, that was uh, the, the great thing with William that suddenly I could talk about South Africa, Johannesburg, Mandela, William Kentridge, each one of them. And I could have really set up a, a lecture series to travel around America in those days because you know, nobody knew about any of those things. Mandela was known, although I was surprised Mandela wasn't really known everywhere in America. So that was where I was very, very fortunate. And uh, I really was able to show William's work very early on and uh, actually had enough, a big enough body of work by 1998 to do a show of the editions I had done with him. And it was at a small gallery in, in uh, Chicago, a lady called Cindy Bordeaux, and uh, it was a great show. And it had all these works and various others. And so I gained confidence in that. Well, I, I should have said that I was showing the work and nobody was really that interested. And I even took part in one of the, the first IFPDA event up at the old armory and uh, with, with a chap called Robert Brown. And uh, nobody really showed any interest in William's work at all. You know, it was still the, so I decided I wouldn't join the IFPDA anyway. 
But uh, it, it was exciting for me because I had all these stories to tell. I had this interesting work to show. And the great thing was, so was there was this film, that this footage of Williams. And so he covered all bases, the filmmaker, a printer, a highly intelligent individual, an extraordinary communicator. And it was so fortuitous. But there's fun. I mean, there's that picture is him and I working on a, a play together in Jack's studio. Um, I'm not quite sure why I got involved, but it was always a lot of fun <laughs> when uh, William did get down to, um, to Jack's studio down in Wiltshire. I made a point of trying to be there as well. So I did a lot of happy snaps and every now and then got involved in something more directly. But this was a case here of William working on large plates, um, which he really was so excited about. Right, because I mean, one of the things I, you know, that we've talked about, I wanted to just throw out there is that the opportunity to work at this scale, it, would, it just there were not large presses in South Africa at the time, and so he he would not have had access uh, to be able to work at this scale, and so, and then there's also the scale of the printers involved. So for you getting to work, send William to work with Jack. Um, it was on, on a lot of levels, a real treat for William as well. Cause I think that's something that, you know, we've talked a lot about on, yeah. you know, when you get an opportunity as an artist to do something and especially given that his, it's not like there was tons and tons of sales of these early works, but you kept sending him back to Jack and kept publishing works. I think that's something for people to really understand too, is that, you know, in the beginning, it was more of, faith in the artist and faith in the process and understanding of a long game of publishing, which we've talked a lot about too. So, I mean, do you want to tell people how the sleeper came about actually? Cause I think it, it dovetails on, you know, the trip. Well, to can America I just too. tell one other story about sure. in, those, in the 1990s when I used to travel around in the UK, it was almost like I had a, I used to walk around with these colossal tube just to be able to show people these things. It was like a rocket launcher. I used to get on flights and, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and I will never forget the first time I actually presented the Museum of Modern Art. And I had a lot of these, these works and I opened them up and, I, and everybody was fascinated to see the works, to hear about South Africa, Johannesburg, Kentridge. And then there was never any sign that anybody wanted to buy anything. But uh, talking about the smaller works, what happened was William was uh, in South Africa, worked with a, a chap called Malcolm Christian who had Cavisham Press. Also an artist who'd left the big city, went to live in the countryside, set up a press. And William used to go down there with two other artists, the late Robert Hodgins and Deborah Bell. And then they'd make a body of prints. So they'd do eight prints each uh, and they would be in series. And at that show that I did in, um, in Chicago in 1998, there was a set of eight works, which were Ubu and the Truth Commission. And what they were, the Truth Commission, of course, was also so consequential and so important. Uh, and what William had done uh, in, in terms of that series of eight prints that he did in that, in that with Cavisham, um, was he created a theater piece uh, by using the Ubu figure. And what he would do in terms of making his marks, he would do a, thumb, a thumbprint on the buttock. Um, and, he, and so eventually I said to him, well, look, you, you know, instead of doing the buttock that size, why don't you go along and do it full scale? And he said, sure. And so he happily went and Jack organized these plates a meter by two meters. And William arrived uh, and, you know, what he then, began to do was actually flog the plate. Uh, the theory, the idea was that the, the marks on the body reflect the history of that individual. If you look at his other work that he's done, there's always all those marks. Cause even you know, when he used to make his drawings, he, he would also whip them and do everything, have his ride over them with bicycles. And he did the same thing really at Jack. And, um, the plate, he, he works incredibly fast and he, he did the main plate, which we called sleeper one. And he then carried on with the idea of another plate, which he used the Dremel for to create the, the Ubu figure. And then finally they had a discussion and William took the plunge and 
did uh, the background in carmine red. Uh, so Jack was there was there was fifty. This was the the the, the red, um, and this was an addition of fifty, which was completed. Uh, the first the the sleeper one. Um, the, the, the addition is still not, I mean, the addition is printed, but William is wanting to do handwork because he, he wasn't happy that there was enough black. So he, he was, when he there, there was, he saw 20 of them and they were fine. Uh, there's another 10 or 15 of the addition, which are still awaiting him doing his watercolor, doing hand painting. And what was great about what he used to do is his ability to use a wash uh, to just bring depths and, we change works quite dramatically. So one can talk a lot about the, the sleeper, but we, why it was so consequential, yeah, there's the Ubu figure around it. And that was, as I say, done with the Dremel as a separate plate, not a perspex plate. And then there was one in black without that. But while, what had happened was at that stage, digital technology was beginning to happen. And um, uh, there was, I used to I used to see a lot of CD-ROMs in the, in the in America, and there was a great one on Jasper Johns. And I looked at it, and I thought, "This is really not, this is great," but you you really don't have a need to go back into it. And I then I said to William, "Look, why don't we do a CD-ROM?" And he thought it was really a silly idea. But I said, "Look, you know, we can have all your images, all your you know prints up there, and we can have video of your theatre pieces and your films and all that." And I had, I thought it might be a sort of a catalog resume because he had done quite a lot of work. And so I found a couple of students down in Cape Town and I said, let's do it. And William said, okay. And uh, he, he then sat in the sound box, spoke for an hour. And then uh, a lot of the images that we, we scanned weren't good enough because the scanning was bad. And I researched everything that had been written on him, so which was 120 pages of text. And that was all assembled into a CD-ROM, uh, which I published in 97. And therefore I created this company, which I hadn't planned to do called David Crude Publishing, which was you know, just for this one-off product. And it was a great product because curators wanting to learn about William, um, it was always problematic as for any artist who wants to keep being interviewed about the same thing. And it was really interesting when he was about to have a show at Macba in Barcelona, the, uh, the curator came by and he, he sat down the night before his meeting with William. And it took him, takes five and a half hours to go through it, which he did. And so that was really another way of presenting the artist. Um, and in fact, what was, was also interesting, I'm not a natural platform speaker, but I, I was invited to go to Reed College uh, in, in Portland, Oregon, and do a presentation there. And what I did was I used the CD-ROM really to do most of the work. And I would just move between the different sections. There was, so there was him talking, there were sections of, uh, of some of his film sections of his theater pieces and all that. And so I learned a huge amount and gained a lot of confidence in the fact that what I was doing was really communicating and I, so fortunate to have such a brilliant artist to be presenting. And, you know, and that, that, that relationship has now continued for 30 years. Of course, you know, William worked more or less mostly with, with me up until the early 2000s. Uh, but then you know, a, lot of, a lot of print shops were, were happy to, uh, to invite him. But I did do a lot to support the workshops in South Africa, which Johannesburg didn't have a dedicated etching print workshop. It had, uh, it still has Artist Proof Studios, which is, uh, which was established by Kim Berman, which was a, a funded organization, which was to try and help people, artists, people who wanted to be artists to come in and see how prints were made. And this work that's up at the moment was, and there's two of their printers. This is a telephone lady where the, that work was bigger than their press. So, I mean, this was also my, you know, the silliness I did. There was, uh, was it ABC um, paper in, uh, down in, in uh, around 14th Street? I went to that, the old print shop, but used to, there was always there that everybody 
bought them with their papers and prints and everything. And so I, I bought some exotic uh, Japanese paper, which was about 10 gram paper or 15 gram paper. And then I bought the, uh, the canvas that Andy Warhol had painted on, had this work all shipped to Artist Group Studios. And that's what is, is, uh, came about in, these, in this, this work and another work called uh, Walking Man, which was another huge liner cut. So when, again, this is colossal work that William enjoyed doing. Right. I mean, I think I think what's important to kind of help people understand here, too, is that um, you've been consistently publishing William's work up to this point and it's and putting it out into the world, not necessarily with the with a huge financial return at this point. Like the work was some of it was moving and he was gaining in notoriety, especially after his um, documented inclusion in 97. I think it was documented 10 that he was part of, um, which helped. But you are still providing him with these opportunities. And I think what's important to talk about here too for everybody else to know is that up until this point, um, you pretty much had been sending William out to work. And this really was kind of a transitional point where um, you were started producing more work in South Africa. And, you know, I think it's you know important for people to understand how that setting up of your publishing company in South Africa really um, starts the transition to all the stuff that you're doing today um, with the workshop and with your publishing empire. Because this to me is like one of those major transitional <laughs> points. <laughs> so, well, uh, empire, yeah, it is a horrible word, but you know, but I mean, you know, it's, for, it's, 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 all really about, in so much. <laughs> it's all really about the printers. And, you know, I got so lucky to have someone as exotic and eccentric as Jack. We were similar sort of personalities, the crazier, the better. And uh, then, you know, what also became interesting was meeting Randy, who's, who's up here as well. And um, he's on high end. And um, because I had accumulated a lot of William's work in, in America, because I was, that's where I was showing the work, you know, I'd given Gracie Mansion a show, she'd reopened her gallery, this lady, Cindy Bordeaux, I had enough editioned work to give people a body of work that they could show, okay, like uh, Robert Brown in, in Washington. These were always small, you know, low pro you might say low profile type of uh, dealers because I, you know, I, was, I, was, I, didn't, I, I, I was really, um, you might say sometimes out of my depth in understanding working in New York, you know, the epicenter of, of the art, so I, I was always I was very conservative. But having met Randy, who had a need to 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 need to carry on in West Twenty Sixth with his Gallaman, Gallamanda Press, uh, and, and he had some space, so I said, "Okay, we'll move. I'll move in, and I'll have William's work and other work that I that you know I was working with him on." And Randy had his workshop, and it was a a wonderful collaboration. And he I invited them he, them to come to South Africa. And um, we had been exploring photogravure with an artist called Gary Schneider and Randy uh, and like everything, uh, there's a picture there. It was all very much pioneer type work. And I always felt part of that. It was, we, we never exactly knew how it would work out, and, but I invited then Randy to come to South Africa, which he, he then did. And he, uh, he did, did, did some further gravures with William. And he also then, uh, I don't, Randy, I don't know if he remembers if he gave William the copper plates or if I did, but R William did some, some dry point work, gave them to Randy, who then took them back in addition. And he just loved the way the marks that Randy made. They, he could turn a dry point mark almost into a charcoal line mark. And that then took me into the second phase of, of the activity where Randy had come for three months and I suddenly realized we don't have a place for him, a press for him to work on because uh, none of the press could, could take the pressure needed. So inadvertently, I said, well, okay, we, we better, we'll have to, if somebody had offered me a press, I said, we better let's start a, a workshop because he's there for three months. And so in July, 2002, I, I suddenly had a second space uh, being someone who didn't want any space at all. And Randy was there to help us set everything up. And then he departed. And of course, I had a workshop with no printers. 
Um, so, you know, there was a sort of thing that sort of happened in my life, but Randy came back on a couple of occasions as well. And then, and he would originate work, uh, which he would then take back to Gallimander, New York and be able to audition. And we were fortunate, uh, William had a, a residence at Columbia for an extended period of time. So he was able to do uh, the, the editioning and the signing and the, the body of work grew. It was all around uh, a book uh, called Zeno that William was obsessed with. Uh, and he did, he did theater piece around it and two, three series of, of prints. Uh, I, think, I mean, I think definitely something to interject here for other people, they, they may have missed or may not know it as much as the different skills of printers and what they offer to artists. And one of the things that, you know, was really happening in this transition period of you sending William out to work with Jack in England and versus him working with Randy either in Johannesburg or in New York City was the different skill sets that the printers brought to the table and how that evolves the work for the artist as well, because it is so much of a relationship. And so like you talking about Randy's ability with printing dry point in a, in a different way that got him a quality that he really loved was something that, you know, kept William engaged as well as making the work. And I think it's important to point out that, you know, over such a long relationship and period of time, some of that changing of the element of the printer occasionally or bringing in new voices has kept the work alive. And it's something that you've really been willing to do. Whereas a lot of publishers, you know, it's like it's one printer and one shop and that's, that's the way it is. And I think, I think that openness is something that's really not just benefited William's work, but all the other artists that you're working with as well. Well, just, I mean, I never sent William anywhere. <laughs> he, used <to> go, <laughs> he used to go to London to be with his parents. They lived in London and he was, he was having a couple of shows and he also would go and visit his parents. So it, was, it was a very fortuitous, otherwise having to pay for plane tickets for him to be going to the UK and all that would have been way beyond my, my capacity. But what I also loved was the idea of nobody had done photogravure in South Africa. And so Randy coming out, we, we, you know, he, he, it, it was a struggle because the level of humidity at that time of the year was problematic. Joburg is very dry. It has, summer has no rains whatsoever. But, um, it's, but we, you know, we pursued and he, he, he you know, along came these photogravures. Um, and then, um, you know, as I say, then the continuity of having this big body of work, because William works very quickly. And by the early 2000s, you know, there was, there was a, a, body, a good body of work for showing. And that, in, you know, that gave me a sort of a, a reputation that I was a publisher that maybe artists should take a little bit more, serious, more seriously in America. So, uh, you know, I approached Donald Sultan and I approached uh, to do some uh, Okiyui prints with Joe Watanabe. It was, it was very much, you know, it, it gave me a platform to be connecting with all these workshops and learning with them and, and always coming as an enthusiastic novice. And I enjoyed that because everything was a learning curve. And what I, I was trying to do, I mean, generally was to try and have a body of work which could be promoted in an orderly way. And also to try and make the work affordable. Because what I had learned from the days of being the dealer, the secondary dealer, you might say, in David Hockney's work, was to have the works very, very affordable to start with. So you could have bought David Hockney's work for 100 pounds in the early 80s. And what happened, a lot of people therefore did. And therefore, a lot of people were aware of David Hockney as an artist, and we'd have his pictures on the wall. And to me, that made sense because I was interested in helping artists' careers to be noted and to promote them. And to getting that was what was exciting. I found a way to assist creative people. I just I try to help I've assisted people in other areas as well, but I always felt creative people are there to create. And there are other people around who should do some hand holding for them. And this is all days prior to internet and and all that. And so I was very flattered that I could actually assist people in their careers. Kentridge was an extraordinary situation. I mean, what it's, you know, somebody so brilliant and the timing and all of that. But it, it allowed me then to start bringing a lot of young artists into our realm, into our workshop. 
And um, I was just about to say, I, I want to touch on the fact that in fact, my evolution as a publisher has been, it's, been, it's, it's worked because of four printers. One is Jack Sheriff. The next one is Randy Ingham House. There's you who made six visits to South Africa. And then there's Jill Ross. And the four of you were, have been these great collaborations. There's a great picture, this crazy series that Jill got us involved in. She went to see William's big project in the, at the, on the Tiber River, uh, Triumph and Laments. And uh, we are still busy. I think we finally finished editioning this project of which are colossal woodcuts. Um, so that was, that's also been, so I've, you know, I've had these sort of, the compadres or padres who've sort of been happy to go along on these crazy rides with me. And the success, and there's another couple of young princes, that's our workshop now. And so the success, this, you might say, because of this, this phenomenal success of Kentridge and the escalation of the value of his work, the, the income that I was able to generate, I plowed into the workshop in South Africa, because I was born in Johannesburg, and uh, you know, I wanted to put something back. I was educated there, and I left there in the early 70s. But here was a way I could do it. I was able to start employing people. I could invite artists who'd never worked in a workshop before. And it's grown tremendously. And besides the, uh, the workshop, we also had a publishing division because um, not, you know, there, was, there were no books on South African contemporary art. And I'd been approached by the French to do something about that. So I ended up creating a series of books called the Taxi Art Books. So I mean, it was really just, it was, a, it's been, it was a crazy sort of joyride in the early 2000s. And all these things I would just do, work hard. And when one reflects now backwards, you reflect back, they really were all very important. And so I'm able to reflect on 20 years of having worked in South Africa and um, having what is effectively a not-for-profit organization uh, where I, I, I pay people to come and learn and to develop skills. And hopefully that will continue. Um, I mean, it is now, it was actually 40 years ago that I worked with Jack Sheriff. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but that's how long ago it is. So there's a lot of monologues, which my, anybody who comes within a yard of me will have to listen to, especially <laughs> my staff, who, you know, most of them are paid to listen to me. So it's really very exciting. And the, the, love of this, the love of collaborating with people who have an amazing talent, which is always, and, an, and generally an intellect as well, because we know for an artist to, to go the distance, like, you know, they've got to be able to do more than just paint or whatever. But I think we have always, uh, I've always been like, I mean, drawing has always been what it's about. And it's always been about works on paper. I mean, it's like the most tough arena for a public, for a dealer to really survive. And even today, it's even more difficult because editions are so marginalized by a lot of the new galleries who don't know the front end from the back end of any of the mediums. Uh, but we carry on. And, you know, I remain, you know, I, I, I remain in love with paper. Right. I mean, I think for me, this image really encapsulates so much because it's, it's this teamwork effort you know, and of, of a group of people carving blocks and the process that Jill had set up for all the carvers was to, you know, constantly rotate the blocks so that there was a, a group continuity versus that kind of individual cut coming through. And I think a lot of what you've been talking about is the ways in which different elements of the print shop and of the print world and those parts of the art world that were really savvy to what was going on in the print world worked together. Because a lot of what you've done over the years is create a lot of uh, deep connections between different people, whether it be printers and artists or dealers and work and dealers and other printers. And, you know, I think it's that, it's that kind of communal environment of a print shop that gets extended out. I, th I think that's a lot of, you know, for me looking at it from the outside and the work that we've done together, that's what a lot of that has been for me. Um, and, you know, and so, I mean, I, if you want to talk a little bit about the environment at the studio. Well, I think just to, to sort of expand, I mean, it's always been about collaboration. It's about the collaborators. I would never have been able to 
achieved what have done what I've done uh, without collaborators in the sharing. And in a way, bringing, because I spent so much of my time in, in, before, in the early days, I used, to, I used to go to museums continually. I used to go to auction continually. I, would, I would, was on a massive learning curve and I had a, a good retentive capacity. So when artists used to come into the workshop arena, uh, I, could, I could refer them to things they may not have seen, especially in South Africa where not many people, there are no real museums they could go to where they could learn. Um, everything was very localized. So I was able to bring knowledge and information about artists. So a lot, I used to often be around the press and I would look at a, an artist, you know, we'd be pulling, we'd making some plates and we'd look at a proof and I'd say, uh, you know, let me show you something. And I'd go to the work, I'd go to the bookstore and bring out a, ball, a book on Paul Clay. And I'd say, are you familiar with this person? And they would say, no, well, I'd say, you should look at this because there's some interesting similarities in terms of what you're doing. So I really have thrived on that, and you know, and it's in a way allowed me to sort of be a, a, a sort of small time creative director uh, by giving the uh, the printer and the artist some additional information and ideas and input that they would maybe not get at other workshops because I was able to step back from this. I wasn't having to be that hardworking printer originating with the artist, additioning, trying to work out, you know, how they were going to pay their bills. And, and you know, because let's face it, most print workshops now have folded and uh, it's the only part of the mega companies or the work of the universities that are still able to maintain them. So, um, but the atmosphere, it, it's, it, the workshop has been great. And I think, what was, what was wonderful how Jill arrived and I didn't even know who she was. And uh, you know, I came in one day, this was our first workshop and she had met a South African who had brought her to South Africa. She thought she'd be there for a year. And I think somebody it sort of told me she was coming and I said, okay, she can enter. Um, but what was so great, again, working with someone who was so enthusiastic and passionate and uh, she, she, there was a lot of handholding as there was with everybody. Because anybody, I couldn't find in a way when I, in, you know, I didn't have printers. There was a, there was a chap, uh, you know, one chap, uh, Tim Folds, who had spent time with us, but he was really should have had a workshop on his own. So Jill, who had only been with us for a year or two, suddenly I said, Jill, you, you've just got to become the workshop manager because I'm having trouble dealing with this guy. And then she rose the occasion. And then, you know, three or four years later, suddenly I said, okay, Jill, it's time for you to go and work with William Kentridge. And I think she nearly fell over. Uh, and that's been, a, you know, a wonderful opportunity for her because William is such a brilliant printmaker that printers learn from him. I mean, William himself, you know, could print his own work. He's, he's a brilliant printmaker. And so that was really the whole atmosphere. And now we're very fortunate with this very big location in downtown um, where we've got a, a lovely space and I've got, there was five printers, but Jill has now relocated to, to Saskatoon. And you know, she's busy setting up a workshop and she's using all the skills, the c connections with William, the knowledge. And no doubt she'll be, revi she'll be reviving interest in printmaking in Canada because of the passion. And I think that's, what's happened in, in our place in Johannesburg because the having Phil come by and, and do a lot of handholding and sharing his experience in terms of that no problem. I mean, it, it, Phil, you, you've always astounded me because I've, there's no problem you can't solve. I can compliment you. If I ever wanted a man to deal with a problem, you'd be the go-to guy. And also, you know, your, your colossal knowledge besides technical, you know, as an art historian. And so each one of these people have contributed to this sort of really wonderful print shop and a very open print shop in that we have people just walking in unsolicited and, you know, we, they just stand and watch. I think we've got to- we, we've got Yeah, to, I think, I think it's something for people to really know too, is that your, your main print shop is fully open to the public. So someone can come in to maybe look at an exhibition or into the bookstore that's attached 
and see a print workshop in action, which is extraordinarily rare in the United States to be able to just walk in and see people printing and engage with people. But, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I picked up from you was the value of that and creating um, long-term, long-term supporters of prints. I mean, the number of people just in the limited amount of time that I've spent in South Africa um, printing uh, engagement with people who, you know, end up becoming long-term clients for you guys because they got to have a conversation with someone about why they were actually doing this crazy thing, you know, wiping one of these plates that's as big as you or, you know, all of that work and effort that goes into making something, they, they start to look at it and value it differently. And I think, you know, f- you know, part of what it is that you've done and in South Africa is, is as much as a publisher, but as is as an educator, I would say, you know, with, with the bookstores of providing access to people have information of work outside of their local area with the publishing program, with the gallery program that's come up with the May and all of the other public programming that Jill had started when, um, um, before the pandemic, you know, that all those, all that public engagement, I think is something that is not, um, is not standard practice. It doesn't necessarily produce you income. And when, so when you say you operate a lot as a, almost as a not-for-profit, I would wholly agree with that because of the amount of just sort of community engagement that you, that you work with and that the workshop really becomes this place that's um, for people to learn and engage. And I think it's that openness and that willingness that keeps it, keeps it moving and keeps the artists coming back. Well, you know, I did, I, I, I sort of learned one thing early on, you know, I, I helped somebody set up an art gallery just off Bond Street in London in 1973, 74. Um, and, I, I, and I helped them employ, but I swore I'd never have an art gallery because you just, you, you've got four walls. And if nobody walks in, what do you do? And so when I became involved in South Africa, uh, I realized that I've, I've got people who are gonna be working there. And if there's nothing going on, if the artist working in the print shop, well, they better start learning how to write and the, or they better start learning how to take photography or, uh, or get involved in, in book design and things like that. And so it was that the employee, anyone who was in my employ was, was never short of things to do. In fact, they were always overloaded, but the learning curve was complete because there was book publishing, then there was a bookstore, and there was work, there was a workshop generating work, and then we had to sell that. And then it was very much also about sharing education, because I got involved in South Africa in the 90s because it suffered this colossal drain of, of skills. And there was this core, you know, up skills transfer with people just come to the country and help mentor, you know, monitor and mentor. And um, that, that was really, it, 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 I was able to go in and do that. And I've also, I mean, I've been quite prescriptive. I really only want to employ women. So uh, there are a couple of men around, uh, but basically uh, they must, they've all risen. They've, they've all in a way been mentored, got a, and just developed a grasp of, of what all aspects are, because there's also the business aspect, you know, they need to know, well, how do you, you know, how do you actually pay your way? Salaries just don't come from any, from nowhere, you know, which is, you know, and so that whole idea of them multitasking was also they had the responsibility to understand that what they were doing, how to generate income via sales or whatever. Now we, you know, I've always said we were 80% about production and 20% about sales. And in a way we are very fortunate because we were so bad at selling, as Kentridge's career gathered momentum in you know, 2010 and all that, we had this, this inventory, which was, it could be sold at prices which you know, were way beyond what they were when they were first published. And so that allowed me to also put together, you might say, a business model that really works. And now we have a framing division as well. But none of these, these things have always just been organic or incidental, somebody, comes by and they said, well, I, uh, you know, like Jill, you know, she, they just happen to come in. I mean, and, uh, and it's been very, very rewarding. And in a way, um, I suppose my, my realm of creativity really. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, you know, you and I have had obviously lots of conversations over the years about prints and what's valuable. And one of the things that's always stuck with me that you've said 
when I asked you, you know, why, why print publishing specifically, this is a long time ago. And you said that with the publishing of prints, you can do so much with so much less, meaning that, you know, it didn't take as much money to necessarily, like if you were to say, buy an artist's paintings, like you could buy a few paintings or you could take that same amount of money and pump it into the publishing of prints that put that artist out in the world in a much bigger way that would do much more good for that artist. And, and so that, you know, the finite amount of funds that you have, you could use it in a way that would benefit more people and more voices, you know, and I, and, I, and I've always, that always stuck with me because I, I think that encapsulates the purpose of print, but it, it also encapsulates, you know, the way in which, you know, your organization has evolved organically over time where it's a recognition of, the values that and the skill sets that people may have or the potential. I'd even almost say that, you know, part of your biggest job and what your greatest skill has been is recognizing potential in people and giving them a chance to, to do that, you know, whether it be printers or artists, you know, because even just at the early days of, of, you know, sending William to work with Jack on a massive plate, there's a pretty hefty financial, um, tag that comes with working huge like that and then you've got huge work that you have to store and you have to ship and you know and so like because the minute you go big basically all your problems compound and so you know that level of faith or conviction and just the process the value of the work and the value of the people involved and I think you know I always keep going back to you know you're such a people person predominantly and that's more of what you've promoted our people rather than than their artworks. I, I mean, what do you think about that here in that pack? I'm kind of curious. Well, I think actually there, there was the, the, the biggest lesson that I, the, 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 big, the best message or the best uh, thing that was taught to me when I gave my, my previous career and in 1980 got involved uh, in, in, in the arts is um, that Paul Cornwall Jones at, uh, of the, um, of Petersburg Press had a brother who was twice his height, who was an actor. And he and Alan Christier were the directors of Waddington Graphics. And they were the ones who took me down to Joe Tilson to, for the edition and all that. But Dan mentored me and he said, David, you've got to really understand this is not about you. This, this is about the other people because you know, I've been quite successful in all the other things I've done. I've always been able to support myself so very confident. But suddenly that just changed my whole approach. And the fascinate and the opportunity, the fascination of interacting with other people who I can learn from. And in a way, be able to be a, 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 the voice for great things that are being done creatively because I could listen, learn. And also I understood many fields because you know, I was involved in finance and metallurgy. And I've always you know, tried to understand everything so I can engage with anybody at any level because I'm always interested in what other people do. And I think that's been the great joy because uh, it's, it's a very genuine interest. Um, it's not a great selling tool. You know, it's <laughs> listening to other people tell you what they're all about by the time they've told you everything and you've you've asked them and you've shown that you know what they're talking about uh, they, they forget about buying things and so um but that's i mean that's just the, the funny side of how i work because it's never been about the bottom line i, I, mean, I laugh about it as i'm a cpa and uh, i wish i've never been more successful in terms of what i've done since you know sometimes not worrying about the bottom line i just knew if you if you did things to the best you could they were done with integrity they're transparent. There's a reason for them. You could justify them, why you were doing them. And in most cases, the justification as a publisher is you wanted to help an artist in his career. And you're, you're a sounding board and you, you're someone who believes in them. And, and that, that really switched everything. And you know, that's why you know, I'm, I'm pleased that you know, you, you're aware of that because I really feel so good about trying to help a lot of people. And, Many of them, you know, have gained a lot of confidence, especially everybody I've employed. And the biggest thing that happens in our employment arena is people get confidence. They come out of 
Lot of the, I mean, we've even we've been hired people off the street. One of our printers, uh, he was living on the street. I mean, he had to, I had to take him to hospital to save him dying. And uh, I said, well, look, just come and work and sweep the floor in our workshop. Uh, and he, he eventually ended up with his own print workshop. So it's been a, it's really been a, a wonderful journey. And, uh, you know, there's Kim now who, whereas William would, uh, Jill always would interact with William. Now it's Kim and she's busy working on a series called Studio Life. Um, and this is a, a series of gravures. We, we don't have the gravure capacity, but Kim is, is doing the, the, uh, the proofing and it's a fascinating series. I mean, you, you, you may want to elaborate a bit on it because you do it so well. How would you explain the Studio Life series to an audience? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's emblematic of a lot of the times that we're living in right now in the sense that, you know, when everyone went on lockdown with the pandemic, you know, William, who's one of probably the most scheduled out artists you're going to come across from speaking and exhibitions and um, just general traveling relative to projects he's got going on all over the world, uh, all of a sudden his calendar was cleared and he was, he was at home by himself, you know, and one of the things that I always think of in William is that his primary skill set is that of a collaborator and he's really, really good at, um, accepting other people's input and advice to help him propel his ideas forward. And so here he was in his studio with just himself and one studio assistant. And it was kind of like reversing the clock 40 years on a career, you know? And so what he does is investigates himself and art and the concept of the studio and what that really means for an artist and why it's valuable and why it's important for artists to use that space um, to essentially, as, as he would say, interrogate themselves, you know, and so he started making that suite of films, the Studio Life series of films, which will be coming out um, over the year. And, you know, in true form for William, he generally comes at an idea from multiple directions at the same time. And for him as a printmaker, it made sense for him to also do a, a body of prints and photo reviewer was, you know, uh, a process that he had done before, obviously with Randy, um, but hadn't done in, in quite some time. And it was an idea that, that Jill had come up with um, for the, everybody to be able to keep working, but not necessarily be together and in the same spaces as everybody had to at the beginning of the pandemic. So Jill contacted Johnny Warren down at Warren Editions in Cape Town to produce the gravure plates. The plates get, got sent to Kim. You know, Jill was managing this from Canada and Kim started the proofing. And as, as you know, things started opening back up again, you know, then the, as the series of, of photo gravures has progressed, which are really running in parallel, um, it's like an extra vantage point or perspective of what you see in the films. Um, then he started working back into the plates with dry point, which is what you see Kim pointing to. And, um, and the image right there is the, the dry point lines and they're discussing the finer points of how he wants that to look relative to this image. And I'm sure, you know, with Randy there seeing this, it's, that's a conversation you've had before too <laughs> with William. It's one, you know, very well. And, you know, so now they've, you know, Kim Lee and, and William have developed uh, a really great working relationship together out of this project and process and Joel has set up her own studio in Canada you know so it's it's emblematic to me this project really reflects exactly how your publishing relationship and philosophy it's organic nature and essentially the South African way of things which is just make a plan it's like everything's going to change all the time and you just make a plan you this is what it is and now you're moving forward and so to me the studio life series of films and the parallel body of photograph yours is is emblematic of that attitude. It's like, well, we can't do anything else, so we're going to do this. <laughs> and that's, it's like not working was not an option. And, you know, and talking with William about this project, um, you know, one of the questions that I had asked him about it um, was about the concept of persistence, you know, and persistence of working for an artist in the studio. And he said, his, his response was like, He's like, well, I wasn't going to just sit around and read novels for the length of the lockdown. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that would drive me insane. So, you know, in order for him to, to continue to persist himself, it was really about diving headlong back into the studio and really figuring out what that meant for him. And so 
this body of work to me is is visually quite stunning, but at the same time, I think really representative of the time that we've all been living through and how we've how we've all managed to get out the other end of it. And you know, for artists, you know, being able to stay working has really been key to a lot of the survival. And I think for you with the workshop, having a, a mechanism and a means for artists to still find ways to work with other people versus being so isolated was really important because of that naturally communal environment of the studio. And so, you know, as, as an outsider, someone who's helped out on the periphery quite a lot um, with the printers there in the workshop over the years, it was really wonderful for me to see this sort of kind of growth. It was, it was a, a really positive thing. So for me, you know, that, that Jill's got a studio in Canada and she's going to be able to can make a major contribution there and that the younger printers in the studio are, you know, taking that next step up there in Johannesburg, I think is really great. And it's, it's wonderful for the health of the field. We need that level of energy and vitality, but so yeah, for me, the studio life suite of photogravures is I think a body of work that will endure for quite a lot of reasons, not just the merits of the images themselves, but also the context of the time. So that's my, my two cents on the, on the studio life project. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I want to open this up for questions right now. I think, you know, if, if you guys have um, anything you want to add, now's a really good time, uh, time to do that because we're kind of coming in on our hour mark. And so um, just go ahead and throw some stuff in the chat if you've got some questions um, for David or for myself about this. And while people are potentially typing, um, you know, the first time I, I went to South Africa, I, I think it was at, it was at a major uh, brain drain period of time uh, with a lot of the different difficulties um, that South Africa has faced over the years. And I remember, you know, you taking me out to lots of different uh, like social engagements and people would ask me, they'd be like, well, what do you think of South Africa? And I'd be like, I think it's great. And people on one level would be kind of shocked because, I mean, at that time, the level of violence in Johannesburg was, was pretty high. And um, not that it has, it, it still is, but it's not to the same degree it was. And people would ask me why. And, and my comment back was like, of all the places I've been in the world, I've never met a more hopeful people, a people that fundamentally believed anything was possible. And, you know, and I think that that sort of attitude, that, that kind of South African attitude um, is really the foundation of the workshop. And I think, you know, the artists and the printers who come through on one level um, may not know how lucky they are to have that as kind of an ingrained natural attitude because it's not that way everywhere. You know, you can go to a lot of different places and things just aren't possible, you know. So I think one of the reasons you and I work so well with one another over the years is that, um, you know, when you're like, there's not a problem I can't, I can't solve. It's like, it's just to me, like the idea of not solving the problem is not an option. It's just not on the table. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think that's, you know, for me, that's so much of uh, a lot of what South Africa is too, is that it's, you just have to make it work. You have to make a plan. And I, you know, that was, I walked away from my first visit with South Africa, you know, going, we can make it as humanity. We can make a plan. Like it can get bad and you can still make it work. And, you know, so for me, you know, the workshop there on so many levels and, you know, especially, you know, when we first met, I was, I was the director of the Robert Blackburn printmaking workshop, which is another one of those kind of oases of, it's more important that your, your voice have value and that you get an opportunity to share it sort of places versus the outside world, which may not want to hear anything from anyone, you know? So I think there was a real kindred spirit working there, but, you know, I do want to point out for everybody. I mean, you've been working on prints with William for 30 years. That's a, it's an insanely long commitment. There are very few publishers out there who've had that long or of a, and that dedicated of a relationship with artists. You know, a few that only a few that come to mind are like Gemini and ULAE's relationships with Rauschenberg and Johns as being such long in-depth relationships. And I think it's it's something that's really special. And I don't know an artist who wouldn't want that level of of care and support um, for their work. And you know, to point out too that 
you say yes to every crazy ass project that comes along, <laughs> no matter how nuts it is. You know, I mean, trying to lament yeah. took like six years. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you're like, well, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna say, like, what are you gonna do? Say no? Well, you can tell you I, got, I got backups. I got backups in my life like you and the other printers and the other people, you know, who, who sort of um, enjoy the excitement that I am lucky to experience for being in this creative world, you know, and uh, being able to interact with people anywhere, everywhere, uh, and instantly have something in common. I mean, it's just wonderful people coming in, into our, our, other, our other spaces where we have the gallery, which is a, a beautiful blue house, where in fact, my main involvement is to be the gardener. Uh, but I, you know, I spend a lot of time listening to people and uh, if somebody walks in from any part of the world and you, you know, you can have an hour engagement and you've, you've enjoyed it and they walk away having had a memorable experience of coming into a gallery. Because most galleries, most people walk in and out of gallery in two minutes. Um, you know, with us, it's very often two hours. Um, and what's wonderful, you know, is everybody in the team it's now at the moment about 15 people, 20 people, um, you know, that they all, you know, I think look forward to going to work because I do every day and every day is a challenge, you know, every day you have to reinvent yourself. And that's why we, we, I'm looking at Jill and she's going to have an interesting ride. There she is. No, nowhere in her imagination would she have thought that she was going to be opening a print workshop in Saskatoon. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah, I, mean, I can I can attest to it as well. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that may come through is that, you know, the print um, working in print is on in many ways an addiction and an affliction. It's something you, you know, you get somewhat addicted to the reveal of the image that kind of perpetual unknown or um constant uh reevaluation that you get when you when you see the work for the first time just like everybody else does and then also that interaction with people right so we're all individuals who like to work with people uh, that's why we we do what we do in a print shop and so you know the people who gravitate towards the print world i believe are people who are looking for more of that connection and that time and because we'll give it to them you know and i well, Phil, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you in your new workshop. <laughs> it's close to done. So good, good, if, we, good. if we don't have any, if we don't have any questions right now, um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. It's been a, a wonderful talk. Next week, um, next Friday, same time, Robin Reisenfeld will be back. So those of you who missed her first presentation, we're kind of doing a revised version. Um, it was, it came out at a, at a hard time for a lot of people who wanted to see it and the recording was a little off. So we decided to just go ahead and revisit it again. And we'll be talking about the legacy of German expressionism and how it has carried forward into artwork of today. And she's a specialist in that area. And, and it's, it's, a, it's going to be a, an engaging and fun conversation. And then there's, you know, we're doing this uh, every Friday for a, a little run here. So thanks for checking in and I will see you guys next time. And thank you, David. It's always fun to catch up with you. Thanks, and thanks to everybody for uh, listening. <laughs> and thanks, Phil. Thanks for organizing. And uh, lovely to see three very important people in my life all on one screen. Three printers. <laughs> it's good all to the see best the rest of you. Sadly, as well. sadly, sadly, Jack Sheriff did pass away. So he, he, otherwise, I'm sure you would be in here. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. You're welcome, everyone. Good to see you, David.